Should UCLA bench Dante more? That's the pressing question heading into Stanford week on Locked On UCLA. You are Locked On UCLA, your daily podcast on the UCLA Bruins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to this edition of the Locked On UCLA Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Anderson Yoxhammer. Thanks for making this your first show, your first listen each and every day. It's free where we get your podcast, and it's available on YouTube. So like, comment, and subscribe. And hey, if you're an everydayer, you knew we were going to talk the Dante Moore question leading into today. Bench him, maybe not. Maybe I've talked about the idea of relaxing, and maybe that's what we need to do here with UCLA football for this week, at least, against Stanford. This episode is brought to you by Price Picks. Go to pricepicks.com slash locked on college and use the code locked on college for a deposit match, a first deposit match up to $100. Daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, where does this whole battle begin? Dante Moore, eventually, after one week of a battle, winning the job and taking it from Ethan Garber's season opening grasp. And then we saw College Lee finally in true action against FBS competition, dominate running the football, not throwing the football, running the football, but also getting hurt and not available for the rest of that UCLA game. And at the earlier part of the week, Chip Kelly had mentioned how Kyle Chile was unavailable for practice. One wonders his true availability, despite the release of the depth chart for the Stanford game moving forward. And knowing Chip Kelly, most likely not going to give us a clear update heading into the game so we don't really know which Lee's status officially is at the recording of this podcast. Where do you go with Dante Moore, right? Where do you go with the true freshman five-star recruit who leading into less than a year ago when he was still a 17-year-old youngster in high school, thinking he was going to Oregon, hadn't officially signed anything, had committed to going to Oregon, and all of a sudden, last minute, some rumors swirled Dante to L.A., and the next thing you know, he finds himself in Westwood, and he's leading UCLA to a week one win coming in relief of Garbers in the fourth quarter and in certain drives kind of splitting the role and the battle for the first snaps. And then while Chip Kelly never officially said anything about naming him the starter, he was exclusively named the starter, if you will, week two, leading UCLA to wins over San Diego State, NC Central, beating Washington State at home, but also being somewhat of the reason of sorts for a UCLA team that has struggled to beat good teams on the road at Utah, at the likes of Oregon State, where pick sixes were truly, and his interceptions were truly detrimental to UCLA's ability to win the game. Now there's more struggles like the lack of a run game and offensive line protection against Utah, the lack of consistent passing game protection for Dante Moore, and maybe some good schemes to let UCLA dominate Oregon State on the run like they could have from the get-go instead of putting more into poor situations. Still, the questions are there. Pick sixes in three straight games, lots of interceptions, a turnover machine. He's getting compared to DTR, true freshman year. Some Not some good comparisons if you're comparing the young Dorian Thompson Robinson before he developed and matured over his years at UCLA to Dante Moore, one of the highest-ranked recruits UCLA has ever gotten as a true freshman, especially in the Chip Kelly era. I lean, hey, keep giving him a shot. And you might point out the fact that, Zach, you said he was going to be the second coming. He was a big-time quarterback. You've been talking Dante should be the starter. You're just going to say that over and over again until you prove yourself right. And maybe, yes, I have a bias of some sorts towards Dante more. But I think what leans me to going and keeping more in this position, especially uh, against Stanford, this is a chance for Moore to get his confidence back. If he does not show it against the Stanford Cardinal this week, then you've got an opportunity to switch quarterbacks the following week, which we'll get to if that's an, a case in action for UCLA coming up. And against Colorado, two equally terrible defenses when it comes to stopping the pass, points allowed, total defense. The Stanford Cardinal – and the Colorado Buffaloes, who ironically had a game against each other and the defenses did not show up in portions of that game and led to a very fun, extremely explosive offensive fireworks showcase going into double overtime. 
UCLA gets to play those two teams back-to-back weeks, should be favored in both, and the Bruins are expected to easily handle Stanford on the road for the last time in what expects to be a while, potentially, in Palo Alto. These are Stanford's numbers, uh, defense-wise, against the pass, sacks, everything. Scoring defense, they allow 36 points per game. That's 124th, and the NCAA website lists only 130 teams for FBS teams. You've got 130th for 54%, basically, they allow teams to convert in on third downs. So for the NCAA website, sometimes they don't list every single team, but out of the 130 teams listed, Stanford dead last in the country on third down conversion defense. That's stopping teams on third down. Passing yards allowed. Stanford is 129th, I believe. Colorado is 128th. They've got three interceptions on defense. That's one of the lower totals in the country. There could be worse, but only three. And overall, they're about the 124th best total defense in the country. Which means to say UCLA, if they wish, if they actually decide to dominate this game from start to finish, should have an absolute field day offensively. They should, which is where I lean towards keep Dante in. Answer the first question on the rundown, it's keep Dante in especially for this week. This is a building block of confidence. If he does something good in this game, which I hope to be the case, otherwise we should be a little bit worried, at least for his playing time for the rest of this season, and then going into the Colorado game, where it should be an exciting game, it's sold out with still a tarp or two in the Rose Bowl, should be an exciting atmosphere. You want confidence going to that game that's going to expect a lot of fans, prime time, literally, for the game time and prime coming into that game, you, you're going to have a lot of energy in that stadium, regardless of where both teams are. And two very good matchups for potential quarterback play for UCLA. I know they can run the ball. They don't even need to give Dante Moore as many throws as he's been getting, 33, 44, 35. And that's where UCLA has seen themselves maybe not be as successful in recent weeks, being down or having to throw the ball as much. Remember, the first few weeks, Dante Moore threw 12 passes, 27 passes, and 12 passes in three wins. A dominant win over an FCS, FCS team, HBCU, and NC Central, where he only played very little time. San Diego State, the Bruins, watched Dante Moore have his best game, 290 yards, three touchdowns, 81-yard pass play, and only had 17 completions, the second most of his season so far, 27 attempts. The most completions he's had was in a win against Washington State, 22 for 44, where the accuracy hasn't been there consistently, eyeing down his receivers, and just maybe some poor decisions while mixed in with some poor offensive line play. He hasn't been helped out getting himself into better situations and success early in games when the Bruins are trying to force him to get comfortable. Maybe the easiest way to get comfortable is run the ball in the beginning of games And then all of a sudden you get a wide open receiver with the team playing the run and bam, Dante Moore looks like a wizard on the field when he can hit his receivers in stride that are wide open. Instead of trying to force it in traffic, weave on a rollout every time, throw against his body like Patrick Mahomes, where he just doesn't have that talent developed yet to do that consistently if he ever develops that. I I believe in Moore. I believe in this ability for him to stay in it, but clearly the play and the eye test has shown you he has eyed down his receivers and it's led to near losses in three straight games and led directly to two losses in the last three, despite an upset win, a dominant win of sorts over Washington State at home in their last home game. Now, what happens if Dante Moore struggles against Stanford? One of the worst teams stopping the pass. Getting sacks, they're one of the middle teams in the country, about 90. They they don't have a lot of sacks. They don't generate a lot of pressure, although the tape is out there for blitzing. What does that mean if Dante Moore struggles? That's not good. So who do you go to if Moore struggles? How short of a leash? And is it Schley, barring health, or Garbers, right? Who is the better option with health out the, out the door? Who would be the better quarterback to play for Chip Kelly in 2023 when he's got three options which he had at the beginning of the year to now. We talk about that next on Locked On UCLA.
Well, UCLA might have an open quarterbacking job on their hands. If you're a small business, you want to be 100% certain that you can get the right candidates available for your job openings, which is why it might feel like any potential candidate or new hire is a high-stakes wager for your small business. LinkedIn Jobs is rated number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors based on ratings from small businesses. You can get easy to focus candidate you can focus on your candidates based on the right skills and experience by using the screening questions on LinkedIn Jobs. Who helps you find those qualified candidates you want to talk to faster? And you can post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Get the right hire. Terms and conditions apply. Cruising on, second segment, Locked On UCLA. Zach Anderson, Yox, I'm with you guys. Hey, all right. So I clearly am super biased towards Dante Moore, yada, yada, yada. You got to give him an opportunity to grow and grow. And I think sometimes you got to take the lumps, which is what it was, two ranked opponents on the road. You've got two terrible defenses coming up for UCLA to play Colorado in a couple weeks. Stanford where if Moore can get right on the swing of things, he can get a lot of confidence going into the month of November and set the Bruins up for a fun end-of-year battle at Arizona, which is going to be a much tougher game than many realize, including myself, and then the USC game, where who knows how that will play out. Who will be the starting quarterback? Well, if things go awry against Stanford, I don't think Moore should have a shorter leash depending on what that means against Stanford. If he comes out, in his first three drives and throws three picks or has a fumble and a pick and just looks terrible, then maybe you can decide to try and pull him. I'm not sure that's how the Bruins will come out on the road against Stanford. They might come out angry, probably run the ball in the first couple of plays as opposed to having him throw it every single time, it seems like, on the first two to three, four plays. That's not accurate. I, I just think UCLA needs to put – more and whoever's at quarterback in for success. Now, if more isn't the guy, where do I think UCLA needs to go at quarterback? I, I think the answer is Ethan Garbers. This is with health, not a factor. This is with health, not a factor because Colin Schley's status kind of into question here as we're trying to figure things out, building for the future. When it comes to Garbers, I think he's, there's a reason he was the starting quarterback. There is an absolute reason he was the starter coming out of camp. And I know Schley was a little banked up. You've got Moore, who was the, the youngster. There's a reason they gave Garbers the first snaps. Kelly trusted him more, and literally more, no pun intended, than Dante until the talent was clear as the difference into the throws that could be made. Yet, probably a greater grasp on the offense, a little safer in terms of decision-making, is where you can go with Garbers, and I think he should be the first quarterback immediately. If Morris pulled, it's got to be Ethan Garbers. He's been around. He's led drives almost to win games and bowl games, almost a tie in Oregon game before a late interception. Whatever it may be, I believe that Garbers is the, the option to use if it's not Dante Moore. Now, what does that mean for Colin Schley? We're going to throw injury status out the window here. I think there's a reason why we didn't see him for a while when it was Garbers, then Moore, and finally, for some reason, because I've been asking for a while, Colin Schley needs to get in games. We saw him briefly against San Diego State and had some moments against NC Central, running the football, leading it to a touchdown, turning it over, and then just absolutely laying the world on fire before exiting the game against Oregon State. What I've been asking for, and if you've been listening to Locked on UCLA, there's been various ways Shalee can be used. Whether it's a fourth and short, he's going to pooch punt it and drop a team deep in their own territory uh, on just kind of ambushing them with a little a punt there. Or, and that might happen once or twice later down the season, I fully expect that to happen. That's not the reason you use Kyle and Shalee. Or just to come in and be a change of pace quarterback. Do what they did against Oregon State. I didn't expect him to ever usually as much in a single game, but he can change the game or when they need to run the ball on a third and short, fourth and short. You want to make sure you get in the end zone, whether you're second and goal from the two or the one, or need a big running play, maybe changing things throughout the game. Schley should be playing regardless of who they start, whether it's more Garbers or Dare Schley, if healthy and everything available, leading into Stanford or down the line. 
Schley should be playing. I, I, I asked for that. I, I think Moore should be starting. Garber should be coming off the bench. And Schley should be getting ample playing time to do the things he's good at, which is use his athleticism, change the run game, and once, maybe once, punt the football because he's done that a couple of times in his career. If the Bruins decide to show a look and they don't like it, let them pooch it down the field and drop a team and pin them deep in their own territory. Less likely to happen against Stanford. We'll see how it plays out. I would lean Schley play. He, he's got, if available, let him play. Depending on how it all plays out, Schley's been needing to play. But the problem was he was unavailable early in the week of practice. You saw Chase Griffin go from scout team quarterback to one of the available quarterbacks potentially to be ready to go. It's got to be Garbers right after more. And then if it doesn't work, a porous Colorado defense comes to the Rose Bowl the following week after Stanford. That's a good matchup, I would think, even though Colorado's going into a bye all frustrated and everything in between. I think that's a good matchup for a quarterback who is trying to get some rust off, whether it's Garbers or Slay, whoever. It's building good for the next couple of weeks. I hope they're both UCLA dubs. Uh, you know, only time will tell if they're pretty. If it's easy, if we kind of back off the Dante Moore bench train, if it's Garbers, oh, wow, he, he looked really good against Colorado and he'll get a lot of national primetime exposure. Or is it the once again, Dante Moore freshman growth? What does UCLA look like in the future? I lean, let Moore take the lumps, take the bruises, take the hits and grow this season so the Bruins know what they have. Although you got to go with Garbers if that's the next quarterback in line. And Schley has to be on the field, if available, at any time for any wacky play. Chip Kelly decides to draw up to make something happen in the run game if it's stalling, which it shouldn't, against Stanford and Colorado. It, just to make things happen because he can. I know they showed it on tape now. You don't want to completely show your hands. But at this point, UCLA, go for it. Just Make it happen. You've got three quarterbacks. If you truly need to use the three quarterbacks, then UCLA, I guess, can. Chip Kelly teased us for the first few weeks of the season that we'd see all three quarterbacks, and we just never did until the drubbing of NC Central. We were waiting for all that to happen, and it only happened until UCLA beat and was up by like 59 points. Holding for extra points doesn't count. I still think Dante Moore is the answer, but you go Garbers and then Schley. Schley's got the talent to do it, and I'm just not sure about his passing capabilities. Again, that one pass he completed, a tip pass for a yard. We'll see how that plays out. Cruising on into the final segment, we're going to talk UCLA women's hoops because their schedule is stacked. Finally released everything in between non-conference, conference. It is absolutely loaded. And they more preseason polls coming out for Corey Close's bunch, number three, number five, number seven, whatever number they may be at this point. They are expected to be good, and they get to prove it against some good teams this year in conference and then in the non-conference. Yeah, UConn's on the schedule. We'll tell you when next on Locked On UCL. Prize Picks is the largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform in North America, which makes it now the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports because it's just you against the numbers. You're not playing against some super pro who sits there looking and looking and looking for hours or a shark duh, 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 just waiting to just gobble you up. You just pick more or less on two to six player stat projections. You can watch your winnings roll in because it's easy to withdraw. You can get weekly promotions that lead to bigger payouts like Taco Tuesday. Everybody loves Taco Tuesday and you can do it in daily fantasy sports. In addition to that, if you weren't already loving Prize Picks, you can have injury assurance. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with injury assurance if one of your players gets injured in the NFL and for college football games. Yeah, they're the way to go. All you have to do is go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college. Use the code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, prizepicks.com right now. Prizepicks.com slash locked on college. Use the code locked on college for up to $100 in a deposit match. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Cruising on into the last segment of Locked On UCLA, we're talking UCLA women's 
basketball. A lot of hype continues to grow for Corey Close's bunch. I've been giving them some love recently because we're getting closer and closer and closer to the season. Pick to finish second in the Pac-12 behind a Utah team that practically brings a lot of their production back from a year ago. UCLA brings back almost uh, so much. They bring so much, and they brought in Lauren Betts, the portal the number one recruit in her recruiting class to go paired along with Kiki Rice, the number two recruit in that same recruiting class in the class of 22, as now UCLA looks to be one of the best teams competing as a shortlist contender for a national championship in a year, maybe in women's basketball, that might be as wide open as it's been in quite some time, even going back to last year after South Carolina got upset by Iowa. UCLA dropped their non-conference schedule. They have a whole team-wide NIL deal with Westcom. And so they're just, what, the second UCLA team overall, I think, according to Ben Bolch, that is a team-wide NIL deal. So there's a lot of hype for Charisma Osborne and the Bruins with the young steer freshman turning into, I don't know, sophomore, spicy sophomore. I don't know. What do you want to call them? Coming in. And they've got some big-time matchups. A sneaky opening night matchup against Purdue, who doesn't come in ranked, but they do come in with an opportunity for UCLA to see what it's like to play a Big Ten member against the Boilermakers and knock them off. The next couple of games won't knock your socks off. Riverside, Bellarmine, Princeton aren't going to necessarily bring all the eyes to UCLA, where you would hope UCLA at the time is 4-0 going into a Thanksgiving weekend battle on the Cayman Islands, and they get to play UConn. UConn, who is in some polls ranked two, three, four, whatever it is, just a little shy of being number one. They've got every, they've got everybody coming back. Gino REM is probably trying to make everything mad. Even UCLA is quoted, hey, how do we get better? How do we practice like a UConn, right? Well, you have a chance to knock them off in late November and prove your staying power and get an early test as to where UCLA ranks amongst the nation's best. UConn on a neutral floor in the Cayman Islands, November 24th. Circle that, remember it, and that will be an interesting night to watch or find out how UCLA performs against UConn. They get Niagara, they get Arkansas in Fayetteville, December 3rd. Not ranked are the Razorbacks at this time, but that is a unique matchup in the SEC, SEC country as they try to knock them off. CSUN, then they get to play in the Hall of Fame Women's Showcase against Florida State who's just ranked in the top 20. That's in Connecticut, right? That's all the way across the country on a neutral floor, for the most part, against the top-tier team. The following week, they go to Columbus and play a team that is in the top 17, just ranked right ahead below Florida State, depending on the rankings, whatever you want to use. So you got three out of four matchups where you go on the road to Arkansas, come back to play CSUN, you play a neutral site game against Florida State. You go to Ohio State, and a couple days later, in your last non-conference game, you play Hawaii at Poly Pavilion December 21st. So a stacked non-conference schedule. You got three ranked teams, some top-tier studs when you're going to be facing UConn and Ohio State and Florida State in terms of just straight ballers on the court. We'll see how good UCLA is in the non-conference, and they'll either be – as hyped as they are, they might have one loss, or if they're unbeaten going into that matchup against USC and Juju Watkins, man, that will be a hyped one December 30th, where they get to play the Trojans twice in their first conference, four conference games. USC's ranked. They get to play Colorado, who's ranked. Utah ranked. Wazoo ranked. Stanford ranked. Overall, if I can do my math really quickly here, that's 11 ranked matchups for UCLA and company to prove to the committee, prove to everybody their staying power. Now, the last year of Pac-12 women's basketball will be equally as entertaining, up and down. They only get to play Stanford once, only have to play the Pac-12 tournament darlings of Washington State once. And now, how are they going to handle that? Only getting to play Stanford once on the road, but hosting Washington State. And how do they navigate playing some teams that are equally good getting some love in the preseason polls or just outside of it, like some of the years like Arizona or Colorado, who's smack dab in the middle of it, or the Pac-12 favorite, Utah, who UCLA doesn't host until late February and goes to Salt Lake City in the near end of January. This is a big, big test. I can't wait to see that UConn game where, man, 
that's going to pit some of the best guards, some of the best players in the country against each other. Of course, UConn brings all the star power and everybody into that game. That will be a big game for UCLA to prove, almost like that South Carolina game last year when the Bruins went to South Carolina and nearly knocked them off. Well, it will be a, a non-conference game. It will be important for UCLA to prove, hey, this is where we belong, or this is what we got to adjust going into a season where the program tries to make their first ever Final Four, win the Pac-12, maybe win the Pac-12 tournament, do it all in succession this year, and leave the Pac-12 on a high note with arguably Corey Close's best team she's had, and maybe one of their deeper teams she's ever had, from the sophomores coming, the Swar, Osborne, and Brown coming back. You bring in bets to maybe shore up something they did not have in previous years, especially last year, post-defense, rebounding, and maybe an interior score a little bit with bets. The Bruins could be very balanced of sorts, where they got an option every little spot in the court. Now, how does that play out? Only time will tell. And a schedule that is designed to get the Bruins tested for March and hopefully a top-four seed where they can have a much easier road to get to the Final Four and maybe, dare I say maybe, compete for a national championship, something this program simply never tasted. And Corey Close is on the precipice. He's getting those recruiting classes, building the team. It's up to the players to perform, hit their shots, play scrappy defense, get the boards, and whatever it takes to knock down some of the top teams in the country because this is a wide-open year in women's college basketball. Stack schedule, fun times. Get ready to get locked and loaded all season long in Pauley Pavilion for the women and the men because this will be a unique basketball season for sure. I'm Zach Anderson, Yoxheimer, wrapping things up here. We're going to talk more of the UCLA football matchup against Stanford, building things in. All right, what can UCLA do to be successful? Not turn it over in the first half. Not throw a pick six. Is the defense in for a field day? Will the offense decide to run the ball 50 times? All things I will talk about in the next episode of Locked on UCLA. Thanks for tuning in. Hands up, Bruins fans. Eight clap time, baby. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, A U C L A. UCLA fight, fight, fights. This has been Locked On UCLA. Go Bruins.